Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here today worshiping in your house. We thank you for the many pioneers, immigrants, and descendants who persevered to establish religion in Hancock County, especially for those who impacted us here at Good Hope Lutheran Church. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, well, as you all know, the land has other places to be and things to do. I've already had a couple rehearsals this morning, so I am going to uh, do my part, and then I've asked uh, David Hartman here to be here to answer uh, questions because he is quite the authority. No, he denies it, but he really is. So, actually, immigrant was spelled E-M-I-G-R-A-N-T in the mid-18th century. It came from the Latin word immigrant, meaning migrating from. Where it changed to I-M-M-I-G-R-A-N-T, I don't know. But I am here today to share with you the shipwreck story in history as I have researched it. I have taken it from a number of different sources and kind of compiled it into my version. I'm here today to share with you an immigration story of Hancock County. I was not born here. I'm not a descendant of the shipwreck survivors. I'm a part of the Arlington, Ohio community as I have been the church organist at Good Hope Lutheran since we continue to recognize the shipwreck story every year on the Sunday that is closest to September 17th, and today is the day, September 19, 2021. Good Hope, St. Paul, and Genera Lutheran Churches share this heritage, and I do, personally do not know what generation we are at this point, but definitely uh, past the immigrants' promise on the ship when they got to land to said they would remember this day to the third and fourth generations, which we are way past. The story is an exciting one full of danger, promise, intrigue, violence, hardships, adventure, and a people and their faith in our God. Thousands sought a new life in America with the promise of cheap land, lower taxes, and significantly no compulsory military service. In 1831, German daily living was very, very difficult. Many people were interested in immigrating to America where life was better, cheap land, low taxes, and plenty of wild game that anyone could hunt to feed their hungry families. The country of Germany enforced military service drafting young men for a three-year military term when they were 16 years old. The people had suffered many years of famine, high taxes, and generally poor economic conditions. Now, our local story here in Hancock County focuses on Johann Adam Trock and Johann Peter Eris II. Their families had suffered in Germany over the years and had heard about America. Johann Adam Trock living from 1785 to 1877, was a God-fearing man with 10 years of military service in the Napoleonic Wars. He urged his friends and relatives in Rattlebach and neighboring villages like Odenwald has stopped at that area to embark with him to the United States. Very few in his financial standing cared to come, but many in meager circumstances yearned for the opportunity. And Trock himself paid for 18 adults to come. The summer of 1830 was chosen for the voyage, but twice it had to be postponed due to unavoidable circumstances. The two men eventually gathered a group of friends and relatives, and together they made plans to come to America. In the middle of May 1831, a group of about 150 immigrants from the Odenwald region of Germany started on that 400-mile trip through Domstadt and Castle to Bremen, where they finally settled for America in late July. They packed tools, clothing, dishes, bedding, furniture, food, and some heirlooms to bring to America. Two boats were loading in Bremen. One was brand new. One 
one was old. Naturally, the people rushed to get on the, what do you think, kids? Old boat or new boat? New boat. New boat. And it was soon filled up. The gangplank was lifted and the rest had to go on the old boat. The old boat traveled slower than the new one, but it missed the September storm that would sink the new boat. The old boat landed as planned. The families on board both ships planned to live near Baltimore, Maryland. The new boat was called the Famous Dove. It was 118 feet long, 28 feet wide, 20 feet high. It had two masts and 24 sails picture of it over here. This would be the famous Dove's maiden voyage. It was valued at $35,000. And the ship had a new young captain named Galt and a new cook. But the immigrants had to take all their own food. The foodstuffs included potatoes, beans, peas, barley, herring, eggs, cheese sausage, vinegar, wine, zwieback, which is a form of bread, beef and pork. And so they set sail on August 1st, 1831 in a strong wind and it traveled fast. It took only eight days to get out of the English Channel. Captain Gull estimated 30 days to get to Baltimore. But for 12 days, there was no wind. And a few days where the wind blew in the opposite direction. The food rations had been cut by the captain to save money and overall conditions on board deteriorated. But only two deaths were recorded. One was an infant and another a young child and they were buried at sea. Now the young captain of the famous Doug was on his first voyage. He was not trustworthy and he was always under the influence of liquor. He was just out to make a big profit. The voyage, however, was a pleasant one with only two small storms, one on days with no wind or the <coughs> wind that blew in the opposite direction. Of course, the ship made no headway, but with good wind conditions, the ship could sail faster than a steamship and covered more miles than otherwise would have taken 11 hours. On the 47th day at sea, about 3 p.m., a strong wind blew in. Now the captain had left the pilot to steer the ship while he was in his cabin drunk. Perhaps if he hadn't been drinking, he would have seen the lighthouses on the channel and disaster could have been prevented. Mountainous waves dashed the vessel against the reef and everyone thought they had found land. But joy turned to despair as the ship tossed and turned. Darkness fell and the storm intensified, and a brother of John Peter Aris ordered the captain to cut down the mast. With the help of many men, the masts were soon cut down and the wind lost control of the ship. However, by this time, the ship was broken in two, and it took on water. Everyone was ordered to the upper deck where the devout immigrants prayed for deliverance. Captain Galt ordered the only lifeboat, launched with every intent of him jumping ship and leaving the passengers behind. Now, Trock had been a soldier for 10 years in the German army, had been a bodyguard of Prince Ludwig, and had been in the Spanish campaign under Napoleon. Trock was the owner of seven guns, which he was bringing to America in anticipation of hunting game, a pleasure that was forbidden in Germany. Perceiving that the captain intended to abandon the ship and leave the passengers to their fate, Trock armed himself and six other men. His orders were to shoot the captain or any of the crew who attempted to abandon the ship. The captain stayed and the crew went to man the pumps. Now, in the height of all this confusion, Margaretha Aris, the 13-year-old daughter of John Peter Aris, was reported to have said, quote, Christ has saved the disciples from drowning. 
and maybe he could save us also. A sailor, upon hearing these words, said, Slap that dumb girl in the mouth for talking so foolishly. Any fool can see this ship is, is sinking and everyone is going to drown. Undaunted, Margarita started singing a hymn. For many years, it was said that she sang a mighty fortress is our God, but further research and translation has her singing. This I believe, yea, rather of this I make boast, that God is my Father, the friend who loves me the most. And whate'er betide me, my Savior is at hand, through stormy seas to guide me and bring me safe to land. The passengers were panic-stricken and in total despair. Margarita continued to sing, and others joined in one by one. The broken ship was clinging to the reef. Before long, the seas began to calm, and the ship stabilized and sank no further. When the sun came up, the immigrants saw but a half a mile from shore. The reef sandbar was located about 16 miles south of Cape Henry, Virginia, which is east of Norfolk, Virginia. The crew was able to attach cables from the boat to the trees at the shore, which allowed them to guide the lifeboat ashore. The women and children landed first, followed by the men. The take charge, Johan Adam Trock, was the last one to leave the ship. On shore, the immigrants were given assistance by a gathering of black people, probably the first blacks the people had ever seen. Upon reaching the shore, they knelt and poured out their hearts in gratitude to the Savior who had stilled the storm. They made a solemn vow that the 17th day of September shall be kept as a holy day, shipwreck Thanksgiving festival by them and their descendants, even unto the third and fourth generations. As is the practice of Good Hope, St. Paul's and Trinity Genera today will be having our annual observance of the shipwreck, and it will be the 190th observance. The immigrants were housed in Cape Henry until September 21st. Then they boarded another ship with the belongings that could be salvaged and headed to Norfolk, Virginia. On September 23rd, they left on a steamship for Baltimore, Maryland. From Baltimore, most of the immigrants eventually got to Ohio, and of those who came, mostly settled in Hancock County. The first 12 families arrived near the present site of Genera in 1834. Eleven more families came and others followed. Some descendants also settled in Crawford, Medina, Defiance, Wyandotte, Henry, and other Ohio counties, and also in other states. By 1843, there were 36 families from the Hess-Domstadt area of Germany. Some farms around Genera are still owned by the descendants of the shipwrecked passengers. The deeds they hold bear the signature of President Andrew Jackson. The population of Van Buren Township in 1840 was 432. In 1850, it was up to 536. The people had no pastor, but they gathered in each other's homes for worship services. And the first Lutheran pastor visited the settlement in 1836, but only remained a short time. In 1843, two men were delegated to go to Columbus to get a pastor. Their journey was not in vain. The Evangelical Lutheran Mission Society sent J.G. Berger, a Lutheran minister, originally from Bavaria to the Genera area. The first church in which the immigrants worshipped was located in Van Buren Township at the intersection of Township Roads 32 and 62. From this church, St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church, located one mile east of the original church, and Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church originated. In 1891, the 50th anniversary was commemorated at St. Paul's Church with 10 
of the shipwreck survivors in attendance. The sermon text was taken from Psalm 50, 15, which has been the same text used for the first service in 1836. Psalm 50, verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Now, when the settlers first arrived, the region was a vast wilderness. The goal was to clear land for farming and rid it of bears and wolves. Indians still camped in the area at the time. Log cabins were built for homes. The settlers made wagons and two-wheeled carts. Oxen usually drew them. The women spun, wove, and dyed garments from wool, and with money so rare, rare, neither meat nor shoes could be purchased. Deer furnished delicious roasts. Deer, cows, and other hides were tanned and used for making shoes and other needed items. A pair of shoes would usually last the full year. Everyone was his own shoemaker. Forests had to be felled, land had to be cleared and drained, and there were crop failures, milk sicknesses, and many illnesses. The nearest market for wheat and sheep was first at Perrysburg, then Tiffin, and then Cary. Many of the early settlers lived according to the biblical decree. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's from Matthew 6, verse 33. As is our annual tradition, Good Hope and St. Paul's Arlington and Trinity Janera still celebrate Shipwreck Sunday and the Sunday closest to September 17th. Often a descendant will read the story as part of the remembrance. On September 18th, 2011, we had a large 180th observance shipwreck service outdoors in front of the Arlington School. Some interesting facts. Our sheriff, Michael Heltman, is a descendant of Johann Adam Kupfer. One family was originally named Weiner, W-I-N-E-R, but in America it became Weiner, W-E-I-N-E-R. And because of the high cost of meat, they combined grain meal with their meat that they sold stuff into casing. The major city near the Wiener home was Frankfurt. Thus, we have our modern day Wieners and Frankfurters. <laughs> I would like to mention the Gossman Bible. There's a picture of it also over here. It was saved from the shipwreck and dates back to 1725, and it was owned by John Wiener. It passed from father to son until 1831 when it was given to Adam Gossman, whose mother was a wiener, to take to America. The Bible is now on display at the Hancock County Historical Society since they have donated it there for all to see. I would also like to read a couple excerpts from these pioneers, letters they sent home. The first one is from George Price. George Price, son of an immigrant family, in 1908 was nearly 81 years old and seriously ill, but he gave an interview to the Finley Daily Courier. He was living with his son Philip at the time. He had been three years old when his parents came to America, and he was seven years old when they came to Hancock County. And this is the story he's told about the time when his parents and the John Rush family with their household goods loaded on two wagons made the trip overland in 1835 from Washington County, Pennsylvania to their new home in Hancock County. Mr. Price was taking the lead when his team reached what was then called Potato Creek Swamp near Mount Blanchard. Here, one horse sank to his sides in the mud and could not move. Darkness was already, already settling over the unhappy immigrants and surrounded as they were by a howling wilderness 
the women broke down and cried in despair. The animal was finally pried out of the mud, and the travelers moved on to Mount Blanchard and put up for the night. The next day, they were able to get seven miles farther west and spent the night at the tavern on Eagle Creek, kept by Mr. John Dillon. And the last thing I'm going to share with you is a letter from Peter Aris. If anyone wants to work, he can earn a good living as a day laborer. The people that came with us found jobs and they earned 75 cents a day. They are building a railroad track from Baltimore to Ohio. An ordinary man can live just as well as a rich man. We are leaving November 8th. We'll have 14 days to travel. After we get in this country and after our hard trip, we wished we had stayed in Germany. Now we thank the Lord that he gave us the strength to come and now we are here, we are happy and feel very lucky. Women, the sex part is for you. This is a man writing this. After we got settled, our women won't have to work so hard. They won't have to ask every day, what will I cook today? Again, remember, now they can use these guns to shoot game, which they can in Germany. If you want it, there is plenty. They can do what they want to do. It's unbelievable how different life is here than in Germany. Here, they take a nice piece of bread and they spread butter on it. A finger thick. And then Your ancestors. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions from my part? No, but I'd like to say thank you for it all. Since you are not a descendant, and many of us are. So thank you for taking that notion. Well, and you have a lot more to look forward to from Luann, Jacob, Madison, and Dan. And of course, Jacob and Madison are both direct descendants. Stand up, Jacob and Madison. Oh, and uh, Dan, uh, maybe you'd like to explain about the uh, him, the. the Ah, so in Luann mentioned that for a long time it was, of course, the Lutheran national anthem, a mighty voice of God, was thought to be sung, but further research came up with another hymn, and uh, here it is. If God himself be for me, is God for me, would be in the German. And so today, the verse that Luann read that was a credit to the Harris girl is actually verse two of a 17 verse hymn. So today I took the liberty and we flopped them and that being the movie, the heiress girl singing in German. And then the rest of the choir will join and then the congregation will also join for the verse. So we get to kind of recreate that. And then we're gonna do a second anthem called We Believe, which is the creed of what we modern day people from that ship celebrating that occurrence. We have our expert here, and he can maybe come up and tell you a little bit about, you see the people that are here. Well, I don't know anyone you know. You've <laughs> done a very good job. Thank you. But you did mention, I can, my family, my, this is my mother's side, of course. You mentioned the Christ family and the Roush family traveling together to worship Pennsylvania, which is true. But that's where my connection is. The Roush family had a, had a boy. The Christ family had a girl. When they got to worship Pennsylvania, they had no money. So they had to stop and work to come to Ohio. The Christ girl 
I get into a rich family in Washington, Pennsylvania, a Wilson family. They had a lot of boys and they were real rich landowners. And she worked as a maid there for a while in that Wilson family. Well, if you know what happened, the same thing happened today. She got pregnant with one of the Wilson boys. And when they found that out, the Wilsons, get out of here, we won't share. You're just a small pleasant girl. So they left. On the way from here, from Fort Pennsylvania here, the Price girl and the Rosh boy got married. When they come to Ohio, it's a generic area, she gave birth to a little boy named George Wilson. And instead of giving her married name, she kept the original name of the real father and raised him as George Wilson, even though she married a Raj man. And that George Wilson become my mother's great-great-grandfather, and I have pictures of him at home, the whole family. And I thought, but that, that's just true, what she said. I, I'm just extended a little bit compared to me. I mean, it's my personal story, but then, then also the George Wilson that she married, he ended up marrying a woman named a Fullheart. And the Fullhearts can go over on the ship too. And his wife was born after they landed here, but uh, 1832 or 33, she was born here afterwards, and they ended up George Wilson and Fullheart before we got married. And then, uh, that's how that happened too. So I got connections on both sides. To the full hearts and the prices. And the helpers are in there too, so I'm not gonna explain all that. <laughs> we're all we're all intertwined in there. On my mother's side. That, that's amazing. That, that, I know the whole story on my personal side. I don't know. Yeah. You might think I'm yeah. No, I, that's that is very interesting. I know the helpers story. Did you know the Helpman story? Yeah, I knew the Helpman story. There's, there's a guy on the ship in the morning named Peter Helpman. Okay. He was on the ship. Okay. He had several young children. Okay. And in 1841, they had a daughter. And she married one of the Aris boys. And she gave birth to a little girl. In 1841. No, no. Uh, this this Helman girl married an Irish guy, and then in 1861 she gave birth. In 1821 she gave birth to a little daughter, and this daughter married an Irish. She was only a year and a half year old, and her mother, and her mother died. The Irish guy had three little wives. So she had a lot of siblings, half brothers and sisters. Right. <laughs> Thank you. 